So Wish is the latest animated film from Disney, uh, meant to commemorate 100 years of Walt Disney animation, uh, you know, producing, you know, producing animated cartoons. Now, we already did have this kind of like Disney 100 year tribute with Once Upon a Studio a few weeks back. Um, with, with it, which was a very, very, uh, very charming and I think very respectful short um, that paid tribute to like the long history of Disney animation. It was like a big crossover event and basically it was all the Disney characters um, cavorting about the Disney studio. And then there was like a little heartfelt message to the legacy that Walt had built up. Um, and it was just, it was just fun. It, it was neat to see. It was short. It was like a, around like 10 minutes. It was just, it, it was in and out. It was a neat little animated short. And it was a decent way to pay tribute. Now, that short was, if I remember correctly, I believe it was supposed to appear right before Wish. And I can kind of understand now why they decided not to. Like, well, well, for one, like, it's a little bit long for a short. Generally, you know, the shorts that you put before Disney's feature films tend to be a little bit shorter than 10 minutes. In fact, when they when they weren't shorter, like, there was that whole debacle with, um, I, I believe it was, like, Coco, where they had um, uh, that Frozen short that was, like, roughly, like, 20 minutes long, and, like, people were aggravated about that, so I guess they didn't want to have that happen again. But another reason not to have Once Upon a Studio right before Wish is that it'd be too easy to compare them. Uh, because Wish... Um, it is very much meant to be an ode to uh, to Disney. It is meant to, like, you know, recognize that they've been around for 100 years and pay tribute. But unlike Once Upon a Studio, Wish is trying to... It, it, it has the appearance of, like, an original narrative on the surface. But really, the more you watch it and the more it becomes obvious, like, you know, if not by the second act, then definitely by the third, that this whole film is just, like, an amalgamation of all the Disney elements, all the tropes, all the character types, and just all the references, uh, just all smashed together into, like, this nostalgic hot dish. And, you know, and, and you think, like, okay, maybe it's just taking all the best elements and bringing them together, but once you, you know, once you get into it, it's like, this, this, this tastes off, you know? It's just like, it's, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's all the stuff that you love, about Disney, but it's all like combined here and it's just, it's not gelling well, just because it feels like it's trying to hit all the hallmarks that everyone's come to expect from Disney and just, and not making them like all function all that well together. To the film's credit, it is trying to make them all work. Uh, like, so the premise is that it takes place um, in this, uh, this Mediterranean island uh, called like the, Ki the Kingdom of Rosa. And it's supposed to be a place that's run by this king, uh, King Magnifico, voiced by Chris Pine, who is a sorcerer. And he has the ability to grant people's wishes and make them come true. But instead of doing that, uh, he decides to, like, you know, offer people, like, you know, a, a safe haven. You know, like, you can, come to their, you can come to his island, you can live rent-free, don't have to worry about money, don't have to worry about food or protection or anything like that, as long as you essentially give up your wish um, to the king. Basically, he, he takes, like, your, your fondest desire, like, your wish, the one thing you want to happen in life, uh, takes it away from you, and then erases your memory of it, so that you won't know about it until later when he decides to grant it. Now, now, when he decides to grant that wish, it's just, it, it's at random. It's like, I, I think it's like, it's kind of like a lottery. It's just like, you know, oh, just wait your turn, and then, you know, one day I'll grant your wish, but for now, I'm just gonna hang on to them and just from from that premise alone you can see you can kind of see where this is going right like you know when you start just like basically questioning the logic of what the king is doing here it's sinister and it's so like it's not a big surprise once you know his evil plan is revealed so asha uh voiced by uh, uh ariana debose um she works uh she works uh, in the in the inside Magnifico's kingdom, and she's aiming to be uh, King Magnifico's uh, apprentice. But um, during the interview process, she learns that, well, King Magnifico, he doesn't really have that many intentions of granting wishes because he's very selective, and he decides that he's just going to keep certain wishes. Uh, in particular, Asha is worried that her grandfather, who is 100 years old now, is never going to get his wish, which, I mean... 
a hundred years and he still hasn't gotten it should that should have been like a big tip-off here there, there are so many like big tip-offs to realize that yeah king magnifico is kind of running a racket here he's not good he's harvesting wishes you know all for himself not a big reveal once that happens so feeling defeated and realizing that the kingdom that she's existed in for her entire life has been a lie asha makes a wish upon a star and a particular star comes down this cute little star that has like an adorable little face comes down and starts spreading around magic and showing off to asha all this cool stuff that it can do one of the cool things it can do is it can make animals talk um in particular uh the star makes uh, uh asha's goat uh valentino speak and the goat has the voice of alan tudyk because of course it does. Like Alan Tudyk always does like the animal voices in Disney films. And here it's like, it's a, it's a solid transition. You know, he's doing the voice of a goat and then he just brings like his deep, uh, his, his deep and funny voice, uh, voice out here. Uh, if you've watched like Harley Quinn, he's basically doing like his clay face voice, including, you know, kind of like, like building up his words and, you know, <laughs> having a lot of like bravo, <laughs> having like a lot of bravado to him. Um, which is, which is cute. I, I have to admit, like, Tudyk is doing the best with what he can with this role. Um, I would say the same for, for DeBose and Pine as well. Um, but they are, they are very much like, much like Tudyk. They're, they're all very much locked within a particular character archetype in which we, there's not a lot of time to give them personality because so much of the film is just trying to hit all the familiar beats, tones, and tropes with these characters. Um, so like Asha, they make very, very quirky. Um, they make her, you know, very, you know, like very emotional around her family, very like, you know, prone to like fight back, you know, all the hallmarks we'd expect with this type of character. Uh, King Magnifico, of course, he's egotistical, he's vain, he catches himself just gazing at himself in the mirror. And uh, yeah, that's, they pretty much just like fall into like, you know, the typical tropes and archetypes, all the while making Disney references as much as they can. Like, they, they quote other Disney films, they have little references here and there, like, the, the the staff that Asha works with, they're all, like, the Seven Dwarves, but, like, they're not, like, it's weird, like, they're not specifically, like, these, like, the dwarves, like, but, like, they don't look like dwarves, because they're not, but you look at all their, their, um, their, you, you look at their personalities and the way that they're designed, and you're kind of like, oh, are these supposed to be the dwarves? And the more that you the story goes on. It's like, okay, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, they're, they're, they're just doing, like, Snow White here. And then there's lots of little quotes. There's, like, they, they offhandedly mention, like, Peter Pan and Mary Poppins here and there. And it's one of those things where this whole film, like, it's, it's clearly just referencing all the other Disney films. And if it's not clear by the second act, it's crystal clear by the third act, in which they're kind of more or less just pointing at all, at everything that Disney has done before. Um, and the thing is, like, the, the, the Disney CGI films have always kind of had that element where they're just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're, we're poking fun. Like, here's, here's a reference to Frozen, and here we're mentioning Big Hero 6, and then we mentioned Zootopia here and there. But it was, but it was all kind of like Easter eggs. Here, they're, you know, it's, it's not like background Easter eggs. Here it's like, like foreground Easter eggs that are just kind of have, like, big neon signs pointing to them the whole time, saying like, hey, th this is a blatant reference to Zootopia, do you get it? And here's a blatant reference uh, to, <laughs> here's a blatant reference to Peter Pan. Here's one to Mary Poppins and Snow White and Fantasia, you know, and then, you know, like, yeah, you, you get it after a while. And the thing is, that wouldn't be bad if if the film had, like, more going for it. And I feel like because it's trapped with trying to, like, you know, hit all those beats, there isn't a lot of time to get to know Asha and King Magnifico because when they're not just, you know, going through the standard motions, they're, you know, they're doing the musical numbers. Which, to the film's credit, the musical numbers are... They're good. Like there, there, there are songs that I liked. Like um, uh, I, I like the one about like how like uh, um, uh, I'm a star was pretty good. The the one that Chris Pine sings, of course, I was kind of looking forward to, which is called like uh, This is the Thanks I Get, um, which which is pretty fun. I I like the way it's assembled. Um, but thing is, and I know like I've just recently seen the film, and usually I can't determine whether or not they're earworms, so. You know, I'd st I still have to, I'd still have to take some time to process it, but just based on what I've heard, I'm not 
quite sure like these this is these are going to be like as memorable as like you know the stuff from frozen or moana um which is fair to you know compare because it's like you know it's the same studio it's just many of the same people who have worked on those films so you're kind of like okay you know you, you kind of expect these songs to be you know a, a bit more memorable and of course you know time will tell and you know there are a few like usually i got a have like a while to process these songs like because i think like about a week after moana um i started really oh yeah th these are earworms these are gonna get stuck in my head for a long time um because i saw them about three weeks before it came out and then a week after seeing it, i'm like yeah, yeah yeah that's that's stuck in my head i can't remember as many lyrics here i'm sure like over time that there'll be a few people who will mark these films as their favorites i, I mark these songs as their favorites um, but just like offhand, like these songs, like they're okay, but they're not like, they're not on the same levels like Disney's previous work. Um, the same goes for the, the animation as well. Like you can tell they're trying to merge kind of like, you know, like the similar designs that they've had with previous films while also trying to embrace a little bit of that 2D style so that it can be a little bit more, you know, nostalgic and pay better tribute to classic Disney films, even though... You know, you would think just having the film in traditional 2D would be enough of, like, a big tribute. Um, but here, it, it's kind of odd. Like, it's it's not on the same level as, like, when Disney has tried this with um, uh, with, with something like, like Paper Man. Like, it's not as compelling. Like, you can, you can tell they're trying to have, like, that kind of, like, bright and colorful storybook look. But honestly, it just kind of comes off as just kind of the, some of like the similar designs as like as as frozen they you know like characters all have like you know like the big expressive eyes um you know like the little bit of like the, the bigger heads and you know they have the same mannerisms um a lot of the same slapstick that you've come to expect from like disney films and that's honestly that's kind of like the biggest criticism of this is just that it feels like a very uh, like, like a very like average Disney film or a studio trying to make what they perceive of as like a Disney film, like like a an executive from like another studio is just like, look, Disney films all have this stuff, so just plug them all in here all at once, and then who knows, maybe maybe we'll we'll turn out something <laughs> something interesting here, um, and unfortunately, it just it doesn't work especially when it keeps like winking at the screen it's like oh here's a reference to bambi here's a reference to snow white it's just it keeps bringing up so many of these references that within like the last few minutes of this film it feels like it's trying to like push out as many references as, as it can it's like oh wait we forgot to mention this film and this film and this film and just push it hard like even right up to like the the post credit scene is just like you know another quick nod to like you know like the the, the disney logo and the disney song uh, so yeah it's it, it sadly comes off more like a commercial than it does as a tribute um and especially when you can when you compare it to once upon a studio which was very respectful and like a, a, a decent nod to like the past um which is just kind of like a, a very weird like 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 a weird um idea of trying to make an original narrative but also trying to force in all the references all the tropes all the beats the the same musical numbers and the same brand of like comedy and musicals and everything that you've come to know about disney animated films and it's just all in this big pastiche that doesn't fit together um and and i wanted it to because like i was you know i kind of dug the, the the premise of the film you know a, a king wanting to take away ambition but everything about the way that the film proceeds, it just feels like it's a first draft. It feels like there are good ideas here, but it needs it it, it needs a second draft. It's it's got to go over this. It's got to find something more and not just go through the same motions as previous Disney films before it. Um, and I know that like a lot of people are probably gonna love the film on that basis, where it feels like it's you know it's like the Disney Animation Studio going back to basics with a very uh, you know. Uh, a medieval fantasy story here and you know a, a typical story about it you know a, a you know a triumphant heroine who wants to prove herself and you know live up to like you know her dreams and potential and highlight ambition which are all good ideas but the way that it's assembled here is just bizarre and and just it doesn't work and I, and I wish it could because you know it's 100 years of Disney so you'd want to have a film that paid paid a better tribute but unfortunately that film is once upon a studio and wish is just like the weirder tribute that really doesn't work as well as it should